Hello, everyone, and welcome to the March 13th episode of Pub Talk Live, the live publishing talk show airing the second and fourth Saturday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern. I am your host, Sarah Nicholas. I'm a young adult author, a board member, and agent liaison for Pitch Wars, and a library event planner. And just a reminder, you can subscribe to Reminders via email by clicking the link in the description so that you don't miss a show. And you can also follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Pub Talk Live, all one word. If you'd like to support the show, you can find a link to the Patreon near the end of the video description down below as well. And I did want to mention before we get started, because I mentioned it on Twitter and, and we talked about it on Wednesday, um, the format of the show is going to be changing just a little bit, um, probably in May or June, depending on how the, the guests show, uh, shake out. Hey, Lodestar, I'm glad you can make it. Um, and so we, we talked about, um, so I've been trying to get the guests, um, be someone who has some insight into the publishing industry, can help you learn a little bit more about the publishing industry, some aspect of it, including libraries and that kind of thing. Um, but I know y'all are also kind of hungry for author stories as well. And so what we're going to be doing in May, um, or June is the first episode of the month is going to be more of an author focused thing where we talk to an author about their journey through the publishing industry. And then the fourth one is going to be the fourth Saturday is going to be the same as it has been. So just a heads up on that. I'll probably say it a couple more times. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and bring on today's guest co-host. Uh, Sabria Kalkar is a screenwriter, illustrator, and award-winning author of books for kids, including Ahimsa, American is Paneer Pie, The Thing About Bollywood, Bindu's Bindi's, The Many Colors of Harpreet Singh, My Name, and Strong as Fire, Fierce as Flame. So please welcome to the show, Sabria. Hello. Hi. It's so great to be here. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so Thank glad you, you agreed to come on. Yeah, I'm uh, excited. Yeah, we have a couple of people um, here already saying hi. So Jennifer says, so the um, the regulars who watch my show, they call themselves pubbers. Oh, I love they give that. Themselves, I know, it's so wonderful. Um, so Heather said hi, pubbers too. Karen's here. Hello, welcome everyone. All right. Uh, so if you haven't yet voted in the viewer poll, go ahead and do that. It's going to close in about 20 minutes. I'm going to drop the link um, right there in the chat. And the question is, do you track your reading? And if so, how? Um, so hi, Savannah. Glad you can make it. Lodestar saying hi, Supriya. Hi. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started with some news items today. Um, we have a, a special guest later that I'm super excited to have on the show, who's been on my list since the very beginning to invite, so I'm super excited that she's here today. Um, but we'll do some news first. So we'll start off some some sad news. Norton Juster, author of the beloved book, The Phantom Tollbooth, passed away at his home on March 8th at the age of 91 due to complications from a recent stroke. So um, I work in a library. And so obviously this this news kind of like went around with our staff. Yeah. Um, and sad to hear about that. But actually, I, was, um, I wasn't completely aware that he was still alive. So for me, it was like, oh, he had a, a what seemed like a long, full life. Yeah, I um I, I remember reading that book over and over again in third or fourth grade. So I, I went and got my my old copy out. <gasps> oh, and nice. um I thought I'd I'd read it again with the kids. I, I don't remember oh, yeah. much. I just remember that I loved the book and that and this watchdog. I just remember thinking this was really funny. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Hope your yeah. kids like it. Yeah, me too. I, I think they will like it. Um, the next bit of news is that the new COVID relief package includes $135 million for the National Endowment for the Humanities to assist cultural institutions and $200 million to the Institute of Museum and Library Service, primarily for the Library Services and Technology Act, with a focus on technology training and materials. Libraries will also be eligible for other funds, including some meant to help libraries purchase loanable devices to help patrons access the library at home. I thought that was great news. Yeah, um, it is good news. And the first, um, the last COVID relief bill also included, or the first one included some of those things because my library actually got some funding 
Yeah. Um, and we were able to buy like a lot of materials that we use for online events. So like cameras yeah. and lights and microphones and stuff like oh, that. That's amazing. I didn't realize it covered all of that. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, we now have to say at the beginning of all our programs, this program is brought to you in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm very familiar with that. But yeah, yeah I know a lot of libraries um, are, they have, um, I mean, library funding is always like in danger of being cut, but especially mm -hmm. right now with, um, they're not sure what's going to happen with like property taxes and especially in in towns where the library is part of the budget and it is budgeted by the city or county. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if many people know this, but a lot of libraries, there's there's a big pool of money that goes into like resources for the city or county, right? Um, and that includes police and, and firemen and all kinds of stuff. And so the city decides the library gets mis this much, the police get that much, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And and so in those places, especially, they're not really sure how their funding is going to shake out uh, in the next couple of years because of COVID. Right. So uh, hopefully this will be able to help a lot of them, you know, stay open and consider and continue offering services. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. There's going to be, by the way, I forgot. I always forget at the beginning. Um, all the news items that we talk about, the links are going to be in the description after the show ends. Um, so if you're watching the replay, they're probably already there. If you're listening to the podcast, they're definitely already there. Um, and so there's actually two articles for this one. Um, and we'll, I'll link both of those after the show. All right. Excuse me. The Scribd audio imprint have, has officially launched with Natasha Marin's Black Imagination. It will be narrated by David Diggs and Lena Waithe. The imprint partners with small presses that don't have their own audio lines. Um, some of the script audiobooks will be exclusive to their subscription service, subscription service for three months before being distributed broadly, including Black Imagination. I thought that was so neat. Yeah, it is. I think it's cool because I mean, there's a there's a couple organizations that work with with publishers that don't have their own audio lines. Um, but also we've been talking a lot in publishing about like the increasing revel relevance of subscription services. And yeah. so um, this may be uh, kind of like more going in that direction, which I don't know how much I like reliance on subscription services as a whole industry model, but <laughs> right. we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, I haven't, I haven't listened to, audiobooks and so long I used to listen to them on my drive all the time and now I don't mm -hmm. drive anywhere, so. <laughs> yeah I used to listen to them on the, my drive but now I um because I work at home I don't walk as much at work yeah. and so I've been taking like hour-long walks um around sunset yeah. and so I listen to them then oh, that's nice I need to start doing that um Next up, Maryland unanimously passed a law that requires publishers to license to libraries any electronic literary product for sale to the public. The law stipulates it must be available to libraries on reasonable terms. So I think this still has to be signed by the governor, if I mm -hmm. read that correctly. And a couple more states have also passed similar legislation. So, um, you know. Yeah, it's um, so if you're not familiar with like kind of the context that this is happening and um, there's a huge conversation going on right now about uh, especially Amazon exclusive products um, and they're not available to libraries. So if, if, there, if you see a book on Amazon that says Amazon exclusive, a library cannot purchase that for its collection. Um, um, I'm and so, today, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> and so this is a loss, I think. I mean, they don't say it, but like it feels like it's really targeted at um, that. Yeah. And um, yeah, but they all, it says on reasonable terms, like that's the language of the law. So uh, th I imagine there's probably going to be lots of legislation about what that phrase yeah, means. Yeah, what that means, yes. <laughs> or not legislation, but court cases probably. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Last week we talked about the massive amounts of funding that children's book subscri 
Shimbox Literati has pulled in in the last couple of months. Um, they announced at the beginning of the month that they're launching a new YA subscription box. So we're already kind of seeing um, some of the uh, um, uh, expansions that they're doing with that money, it looks like. So, yeah. um, and do you know about Literati, Supriya? Um, I mean, I just, I just really know that they have that box. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, because I discovered in researching for the last show, um, it has a model that's more like kind of the 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 fashion, the clothing subscription boxes, yeah. where they, they send you. Things? Yeah, you they send you a couple, and um, you decide which ones you want to keep, and you pay for the ones you keep. Um, which is different from how a lot of book subscription boxes work. Yeah. So I don't know if the Y, I, there wasn't a lot of information on whether the YA is going to be like that or it's going to be like the ones that we're more used to. Yeah. Um, That's a really so. interesting model. When I when I was a kid before Amazon, um, my aunt and uncle got me this subscription to a book of the month club. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And I, ha I had that for like several years. So I have hundreds of books from, from my childhood that I still have. Um, and it was like so exciting to get three books in the mail each month, but I, I would have loved that choice to be like, I'm not interested in this yeah. one on that back. So, yeah. Um, um, yeah. I remember reading. Um, so as a kid, I read a lot of books from the library. Um, my family, um, one didn't have money to spend on books and two didn't value them anyway. Um, and I remember seeing like at the back of a lot of the paperbacks, there would be information about these subscription programs. <laughs> and I just like dreamed about them. Like, I just thought that was so cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, oh, we didn't, I, you can do this last one or I can do it, whichever. <laughs> oh, oh, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so the Ripped Bodice released their 2020 State of Racial Diversity and Romance Publishing Study last week. Um, of course, the link is going to be in the description, so you can go look at um, all the different statistics if you're into that, like I am. Um, approximately 12% of books from the leading romance publishers were written by people of color in 2020. This is up from 8.3% from 2019. But it's worth noting that Kensington is largely responsible for that increase. 45% um, of their books in 2020 were published by authors of color. So um, yeah, and so if you take Kensington out of the yeah. equation, the number stays the same, which the is stats something. Really yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right. <laughs> well, I imagine our special guests might have yes. something to say about this too. Yeah, um, so we'll go ahead and bring her on. So um, Stacey Whitman is the founder and publisher of two books, The Imprints of Lee and Low Books, that publishes diverse middle grade and young adult novels and graphic novels. She holds a master's degree in children's literature from Simmons University. In 2013, Stacey founded the New Visions Award, which we'll talk about in a minute, which honors a new unpublished writer of color and will launch for 2021 entries in May. Prior to launching two books, she was an editor for Mirrorstone, the children's and young adult fantasy science fiction imprint of Wizards of the Coast. So please welcome to the show, Stacey. Hi. Hello. Hi, Stacey. <laughs> welcome to Pub Talk Live. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Thank you so much for coming on. So um, you may have heard in the intro, um, when I started the show about a year and a half ago, you were like on my initial list of people that I wanted to come on. So I'm super excited that you're um, here today. Have you only been around for a year and a half? I could have sworn that like, because I've, I've heard about you everywhere. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the show started in October of 2019. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. Um. But I mean, I've been around mainly Pitch Wars stuff, you know. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, Lil Star said, hi, Stacey. Hi, hey, everybody. Uh, all right. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So as the publisher of a small press, you do a lot of different things. <laughs> um, can you tell us maybe what a typical day or a week looks like for you? Well, um, I'm personally still considered part of the editorial department at Lee and Lowe. So what I do still leans a lot toward the editorial side, but as the publisher of the imprint, 
um, I am very involved in the marketing side of it as well. Um, and sales and coordinating with our literacy people and, and all those sorts of things. So as far as a typical day, it is a typical week might be easier. Um, but even that, like, for example, this last week, I've been very concentrated on contracts because we just had a few offers go out. Hmm. So we don't have a contracts person. I am the contracts person for okay. the books that I acquire. And I'm talking about not just negotiating the deal with the agent or the author, but the contract. Yeah, the document. Like, <laughs> yeah. The contracts are the bane of my existence. <laughs> um, They're very long. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to learn a lot. I mean, my previous job, we would we would make the initial offer. We would work out a couple of details and then it would be passed on to mm -hmm. the people who handle the contract. So I had to learn a lot when I first started at Lee and Lowe about how contracts work. Um, and so that has been my week. Um, the nice thing about um, working from home during COVID right now, um, as far as Lee and Lowe goes, is that for the whole year prior to the pandemic, we had been working on moving all our antiquated systems into one umbrella system mm -hmm. called Zoho that uh, it hosts our CRM, our cu customer, I actually don't know what CRM stands for, customer something module. Somebody, somebody probably knows Maybe better than someone I do. Sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's all in one place, which means that we can do all of our sell sheets for, um, um, that go out to, to the feed, to Amazon and to, mm -hmm. to bookstores and such like, so like last week we were finalizing our sell sheets for fall. And so we were doing a lot of back and forth on what that looks like. Um, and, and having conversations about, is this text too boring or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and then lots of meetings, not as many as you'd imagine, because we're trying to streamline, you know, especially with Zoom, you start to yeah. re realize how many meetings you're in when you have to log in every time. Um, and in there, I fit editing <laughs> as well. So um, I, uh, I've got a new YA um, called Wild Jasmine um, that is coming out in the spring that I've got like for the last week, I'm like, that is, that's going to be on, let's, I'm going to spend the whole day editing. And then you're like, oh, I got to finish the sell sheet. Mm -hmm. Oops. I got to get that thing out to that agent. Uh oh, I've, I've got to enter this contract into the system. So <laughs> there are a lot of things that you do as an editor or as a publishing person in general that isn't sitting down and reading books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Monday, Monday, I'm sitting down and reading that book. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's, this isn't, this wasn't a planned question, but when you were saying that, it reminded me, i would read an old interview with you, um, where you said you, you try to edit during the day because you try not to bring home work home with you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, how's that, has that changed the last couple of years? Like how do you delineate between your working time and your not working time? Well, I was just remem reminding myself just this week, um, because the whole reason why I bought this house was to have more room to be able to have separate spaces for things. Um, and when before I joined Lean Low, I, I freelanced for about a year and a half after I left Wizards of the Coast. And the thing that when you're working from home that helps you to delineate those spaces is to have separate actual spaces so that your mind, when you leave that room or when you leave that space, you're in some, uh, like, I have been spending so much time in this pandemic sitting on the couch with my laptop that it's just so easy to turn on that TV mm -hmm. and then forget that you were working. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody else feels that way. Yeah. So I was like, you know, I, I actually feel so much better walking up the stairs and going into my office and sitting down at my desk. And then I feel like I'm working. So that helps a lot. Even if you just have a corner that, you know, you're facing a different direction. Is that what you did when you were in the city? Cause did you not have, did you have a separate room or I, I had a desk in a corner of my bedroom, which made it hard to sleep at night when yeah. you're working all day in your bedroom. Yeah. And so I would go into the, the living room and I would sit on the couch. I don't know about anybody else. I have a brand new couch that feels like it's all broke down a year later. Yes. 
The chair I'm sitting in right now is so like saggy. <laughs> like, just, so I've worn it out. Yeah. It was it was really hard to find that space when I was in the city, especially when you have a roommate who's also in publishing who also works from home. Mm -hmm. So though that was actually really interesting to have a lot of publishing conversations because you're there all the time. What is what else are you gonna talk about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I bet. I bet. Yeah, I remember so when we when everything first shut down, I was in a pretty small one bedroom apartment. And that was the thing that I struggled with the most because I didn't have the separate spaces, you know. And so I had what had been, you know, my writing space was now my day job space. And it was literally like, I'm sitting here, I'm doing my day job. Oh, it's six o'clock. I pick up, I put this laptop down and pick up the other laptop and put it in the same spot, you know? And I was like, my brain doesn't know, like, it's, I don't, exactly. have, I don't yeah. have that 20 minute commute to break it up. I don't have separate physical spaces. It was a real struggle. And well, and especially when I was on this tiny little Ikea corner desk that was just for my personal stuff before mm -hmm. the pandemic began, that was already overflowing. Yeah. And so your mind gets cluttered because your desk is cluttered. Yeah. You yeah. Know? For sure. Uh, yeah. I still struggle with it too, but. Um... I'm sure we're all dealing with it and the brain fog <laughs> that comes with this whole year. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. uh, uh, yeah. And feeling like you're just staring at a screen for like. I mean, if you're a writer who your day job is also looking at a screen, you're just literally on a computer screen for like 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Yeah. I actually just bought a printer so that I can get off. And 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 I would um, normally print out the first, uh, like Supriya knows this, like I print out the first draft and mm -hmm. I edit on paper and then I scan it. Mm -hmm. That's hard to do when you're not in the office and using the office printer to do yeah. this. <laughs> So the last year I've been editing on screen and that's been very hard for my editorial process, actually. Mm -hmm. So I actually just ended up buying myself a printer so that I can get off the screen and get back to my process for early on in the editing process. Interesting. It just it, it changes your brain a little bit to be able to look at, to be able to put out paper like, oh, this section and that section, let's, let's compare, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And you can remember where things are differently when you're looking at paper versus on the screen. Yeah, for sure. I love getting those notes too, like scanned. <laughs> <laughs> you see my in the moment yeah, emotions. I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do love it. Well, I was going to ask you this question later, but since we're talking about your editorial process, um, is I am Alfonso Jones, your first, the first graphic novel that you yeah. edited? So is your process for that a lot different than if you were doing like a himsa or like just a, a novel that's not in graphic novel form? It's surprisingly not that different. Yeah. Um, I'm still printing out so that I can see, you know, how the flow goes. And, and it's a lot shorter of a book um, of a manuscript because yeah. we're talking about 100 to 150 pages usually for a graphic novel, sometimes 200. Um, and um, honestly, I'm still figuring it out because I'm just now working on my fourth graphic novel. So I had a lot of learning to do as far as how the process even goes, yeah. but I'm still printing out that first draft and making notes. Sometimes I'm putting it back into the script electronically, um, depending on the author, because sometimes they prefer it that way versus the written. Um, but, and it's easier to do that with a graphic novel because they're shorter. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> with 400 page novels, I'm like, <laughs> please, please just let this work. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because I know that feeling. <laughs> to spend the time of, of then taking that and putting it back into the. I actually know a lot of editors who do that though, who they like to go through on paper, but then they take another pass as they put it into mm -hmm. the yeah. electronic version. Yeah, Jennifer said, I make all my lists and spreadsheets on paper first and transfer them online to organize it, for organizing. And she says it helps me remember everything. And I think that's the key is there's a difference in how your brain processes handwriting when yeah. you're handwriting, like when you're journaling or something versus typing. Mm-hmm. 
All yeah, right. I think about that a lot, even when like kids are now taking notes on um, Chromebooks instead of by hand. I was like, I, I remember, I can visualize my writing when I'm trying to remember. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I think it depends on whether you're a visual person as well. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about the New Visions Award? Uh, sure. The New Visions Award is actually modeled after New Voices Award, which is uh, the picture book award that Lee and Lo does every year. Mm -hmm. So if you're a writer who does picture books and a writer of color, here, let me back up. So both contests are for unpublished writers of color who also don't have agent representation. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a discovery award. Um, Supriya actually won it back in, was it 2015? Was it that long ago? Yeah, <laughs> it was, you told me in 2016, but it was the 2015 award, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, the idea is that um, we look at novels and graphic novels by writers of color who um, nowadays um, you can have previously have self-published, but it needs to be a new manuscript. Um, but generally who have never published in children's children's books before. Mm -hmm. So for the New Voices Award, it's never published a picture book. You can have published an adult book, but not a picture book. And for New Voice, New Visions, um, pardon me, um, it's never have published a middle grade or YA novel or graphic novel. So um, we've found some amazing writers that way, including Supriya, mm -hmm. um, also Valin Maitani, um, author of Ink and Ashes, mm -hmm. um, also um, uh, Axie. Axie. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we've got Axie O, who who wrote um, Rebel Soul. She's got a mm -hmm. new book coming out in three or four months now, I think. Yeah. And. Um, uh, Julieta and the Diamond Enigma is a middle grade mystery written by Luisana Duarte Armendariz. Um, I'm forgetting somebody. Was the wind? Um, the the wind, wind called my name was a a, a winner. Um, and actually, Shamile Mendez was an honor award winner from several years ago. But she had mm -hmm. several books come out before um, On These Magic Shores came out. So it wasn't her debut novel, but um, we was that yes that was an honor it took me a, yeah. sometimes sometimes we also pick up books that weren't award winners oh, okay. um, that we really liked so for example i don't know if you can see a indian no more right there mm -hmm. um by charlene willing mcmanus who um tragically passed away in the editorial process mm -hmm. we saw that in the um in the contest, but um, it didn't um, go forward to finalists. And um, we went back to it and we worked on it for a little while and ended up publishing it. Um, Charlene passed away and um, her friend Tracy Sorrell finished it for her, working with her family and the tribe to to do everything that Charlene would have done had the you know, cancer not happened. Yeah. And that's a beautiful book. My son's reading it right now, actually. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about the, can you tell us about how you formed two books? Because I think the the way you <laughs> came up with it and the way it became an imprint at Lee and Low Books is just so fascinating. It's, it's kind of, a, the, it came out of a necessity, basically. I, I was laid off from Wizards of the Coast in 2008, along with a large portion of publishing. Um, a lot of editors lost their jobs that year. And I um, went freelance for a while and struggled because finding a job in New York, I was in Seattle when I was at Wizards of the Coast. So finding a job in New York from Seattle or Utah when I moved to there to save some money, um, I had a lot of friends from college there. So it's a cheap place. It was at the time a cheap place to live. Um, so while I was freelancing, I actually had an anime night with a friend every week. We'd watch a new anime and there was one, uh, that I don't even remember the name of anymore. Um, that I was like, I really want to read the light novels that this is based on. And my friend was like, let's start a small press and translate it ourselves. 
And I said, I think you're crazy. I think I think you don't know what you're saying. And she's like, let's, let's, for fun, let's go to the Small Business Administration and do a, a business plan. And let's see. And I was like, okay, let's, let's do this. And so we actually did go to the small business administration. Neither of us had good jobs at the time. I was working 20 hours a week and whatever freelance I could get. She was a graduate student, single mom of three kids. And the more we looked at the numbers, the more she's like, eh, maybe not. <laughs> and the more I looked at the numbers, I said, if I had a hundred thousand dollars, I could do this. Um, and I ended up doing a Kickstarter campaign in the very first year that Kickstarter was a thing. And I did not make $100,000. Honestly, I probably should have waited a year and really done a better plan. But that Kickstarter campaign got the attention of Jason Lowe. And they had been looking for ways to reach older readers. And, and here's the, the thing. I was a clueless white lady starting a a a publishing company focused on diverse books because there was a need. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that at the same time in 2009, um, Race Fail 09 was happening in the adult science fiction and fantasy world. A lot of you, if you've been around long enough, you might remember this. And that was where I was like, well, if I am an editor in-house, I can make decisions that, that does better by these fans, you know, I can do a better, a better job of listening to these fans by saying, let's publish more diverse books. Okay, let's create a small press based on that. I had no idea what I was doing, honestly. <laughs> and when Lee and Lowe came to me and said, should we do, how about you come here and we'll provide the resources. You don't look like you really know what you're doing when it comes to managing a business, <laughs> but you look like a great editor. <laughs> I mean, that was the gist of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so in uh, March of 2010, I joined Lee and Lowe, and that was the best move that for this two books that I could have ever made because Lee and Lowe has been dedicated to diverse books since 1990, and they know what they're doing. And they asked me, have you ever thought about who's going to read your books? And I don't mean audience. I mean, like, readers, um, experts what we would now call sensitivity readers. Mm. And I, I had never even heard of the concept. And we didn't, as a, an industry, start talking about it in terms of the words sensitivity readers, but Lee and Lowe has been doing that since the 90s. They've been going to experts, whether it's cultural or, you know, a, a specific subject matter mm -hmm. and, and having books reviewed for that since the 90s. Um, and then I just basically kept learning. Um, Lee and Lowe sends us all to um, anti-racism um, workshops, like the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, um, which is more of a community organizing workshop as opposed to a diversity training. You know, I think we've all been through those at bad, <laughs> bad companies that don't here, the list of all the things you can't say versus here's the history of white supremacy in the United States and how our systems work to keep people in, you know, mm -hmm. in st stra strata. Is mm -hmm. that the word? <laughs> yeah. um, Lee and Lowe creates a system that works for equity. So that was really the best way that this could have gone forward because I think had I done this myself, I wouldn't have had the tools. Um, that's, I mean, that's really interesting because I do know it happens a lot in romance um, where someone who is a good editor and has every good intention, um, that it starts out fine, but then after a couple of years, the publisher just kind of collapses because the, the editor who started it just didn't have the business kind of acumen and knowledge to keep a business running. Um, so it's, I'm glad that you avoided that. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned a lot about business in the last 10. It, it actually was just about a week and a half ago that we had our 11th anniversary. So I've oh, learned a lot yeah. about it since then, but learning about it on my own is a very different thing. Yeah. 
Um, and I can imagine just like distribution would be so much easier, you know, with a established publisher. Yeah. Um, so we have, so my uh, Patreon supporters, they can submit questions ahead of time for our guests. And so we have our first one. It's from Lodesar, who's here today. He's DT in the comments. Um, oh, that's funny. He said talent, recognizing talent when you were talking about Lee and Lowe and fighting you. Um, he asked, how did you come up with the name for our two books? Um, in Spanish and a few la other Latin languages, it means you. And um, the friend that I was working on this with at the time, um, she was learning Japanese and she um, found a, some Ainu words, which is a, a indigenous people from Japan. And in Ainu, if we actually had this right, because this was 11 years ago and language access on the web wasn't necessarily 100%, but... Mm -hmm. I believe that it means many. And anyway, the meaning of you plus many felt very inclusive. So. Okay, that's cool. Nice. It also means you in lots of Indian languages too. Though, does it? Yes. That's, I just love that, that it just yeah. feels so inclusive of many different languages as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Cool. Um, okay, so I love that you often talk online about some of the more opaque parts of publishing. Um, I particularly remember seeing a thread from you about paper supply last year. Yeah. Which was went strangely <laughs> viral. I was like, yeah. I was just sharing what our, our um, production manager had shared with me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it became this very weird. I have I never gone remember. viral for talking about paper before. Yeah. <laughs> I have never been more interested in paper. Like that was that was the thread. <laughs> it was. I mean, it was so informative, and it was. It discussed something that we don't talk a lot about in publishing, mm. but that is very important to to you know the industry and to the business. Um, and so I just thought that was great. But um, what are some publishing processes that you wish writers knew more about that you wish were more transparent? Well, I think first and foremost, the editorial process, mm. because a lot of writers, they eventually learn it once they do get a publishing deal and they, you know, are working with an editor. But a lot of newer writers don't understand quite how intensive the editorial process can be. And I think that there is a protectiveness that writers feel about their words. And they think that an editor will try and change their words and change their meaning. And, and I want writers to understand that editors are your partner and they're there to help your book be the best that it can be. It's not my book, it's their book. And so I am basically your first reader. I mean, other than, you know, your beta readers or whatever, but I am your first reader who's thinking about the audience and um, what they're going to be like. I'm, whether that's this word, let's add more context because we're talking about a very young audience who might not have the context for a complicated word. Or I'm thinking about um, things like this sentence will make more sense if you put two sentences that are down here, up here, you know, things like that, where I'm just thinking about how to make everything flow better, how to make your characters shine so that what you're intending for them will come across that kind of thing. So basically I'm trying to be your champion within the publishing industry and make your book as, as good as it can be. But let's see other processes. I think it's also um, interesting because I, I see a lot of people who don't understand, for example, why it takes so long to make a book. We are, we've got a lot of digital tools that do help us to make the process faster as far as getting it out in ebook, for example. But the editorial process takes the time that it takes. The printing process takes the time that it takes. Um, especially if you're printing in China, the, the shipping process is a literal ship that takes the time that it takes, you know? 
And obviously, you know, it's it takes a lot less time now than it did 100 years ago, but there's only so, you know, they're not going to be flying books over on planes. The books weigh a lot of, uh, books weigh a lot. And so if if it takes two years to get your book out, for a novel, not for a graphic novel. Sometimes it can take even longer for a graphic novel because of art, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. And the art process takes the time that it takes. Like, I have been following a lot of artists who do graphic novels who have been talking about how sometimes they only have like a month or two to do an entire 32 page picture book because they were given a year, but then it took nine months or 10 months to finish the, the contract and then their deadline is not adjusted, for example. Um, they still have to, you know, I, I hear of authors giving themselves car carpal tunnel because they're trying to make these unrealistic deadlines or, mm -hmm. you know, they stay up 20 hours a day, you know, trying to, to, to hit their deadlines. Um, a lot of times I think that those of us in publishing on the, on the editorial side, on the production side also need to recognize that the art takes the time that it takes. <laughs> um, let's see. Those are those are the big ones. Like the paper thing was something that I had just learned about mm. when I was talking about it because um, we were just happening to have a um, a price shift because we were having a hard time getting. Um, it was this weird confluence of. Uh, a couple of paper mills had shut down. And so, and then a couple of other paper mills had decided not to make book paper anymore because they were making more money making shipping um, like boxes and, and um, paper that Amazon uses to put in their packages and that kind of thing. And so the few book paper mills left were raising their prices and only delivering half of what people ordered because they couldn't meet the capacity. They didn't have the capacity to meet the, the orders. So that was happening at the same time. This was what, maybe a month or two before COVID really hit, I think. Yeah. And um, these, these are things that editors don't even have at the, at the front of their mind most of the time. But I was trying to bet, you know, I was about to send books out to our, our printer and our production guy is like, this is happening and this is happening and this is happening all at once. Wow. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah. When you are Supply talking chain. about, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And we've all learned uh, this year about the supply yeah. chain. <laughs> yeah. When you were talking about editing, I suddenly remembered the first time I got your notes back. I because I was so new, I didn't know what any of those symbols meant, and so oh, I was yeah. googling. Oh what yes, what does any of this mean? Mm -hmm. That's another thing that writers don't yeah. always know um, is proofreading marks, yeah. like what a paragraph mark looks like or what a deletion mark looks like, and if your editor is writing, you know, their notes by hand, you might see a lot of insertion marks that kind of yeah. thing so if you're if you're getting these kinds of notes from your editor excuse me definitely um look at the chicago manual of style online because they'll have a a reference that you can look at mm -hmm. um or ask your editor what does it mean yeah. <laughs> i was trying to look like really professional so i google <laughs> <laughs> and and that's another thing I want writers to to understand that it's professional to ask too. <laughs> yes, it took me a Fair long enough. time to realize that, and now, as you know, I now bug you for everything. <laughs> <laughs> all about asking now. Um, we have another question from Patreon supporter Lodestar. How did the butterfly bush seeds harvest go? What did you want to do? Oh. With them? Um, I have a friend who I, we were trading seeds. She sent me tomato seeds and I was going to send her butterfly bush seeds. And I think I have a version that doesn't produce seeds yeah. <laughs> because apparently the newer versions are, are mm. created not to have seeds because as I was looking through it, it was just chaff. So, mm. so you wanted to send it to your friend? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
But then I learned that butterfly bush is not actually butterfly friendly anyway. So really? I'm gonna, oh. yeah, I, I have a lot of mature um, foliage out in my yard, this brand new yard to me um, mm -hmm. that I just bought this house in January. And um, I want to make it like pollinator friendly. And, and the previous owner was like, oh, I have butterfly bush. And turns out the butterfly bush is attractive only to butterflies after they've hatched. It doesn't mm -hmm. feed the caterpillars. Okay, yeah. So I'll be looking for mm -hmm. other other stuff to help the pollinators. I, d I watched, this is like totally tangent, but um, the, the planetarium at the science center where I live, um, they do these, these like huge... I don't know what they're called, but they're, they're documentaries, but they're designed for the screen. Right. So there, it's just mm. like a huge, like immersive screen experience, a lot of nature and documentary and stuff like that. And they do a whole documentary on the, um, the monarch migrations, um, which was, you were just like literally in a dome of, you know, 360 like butterflies. It was so cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, butterflies are actually very special to me, not just, you know, personally out in my yard, but professionally, because uh, Guadalupe Garcia McCall's book, Summer of the Mariposas, mm -hmm. um, the butterflies are very symbolic in that book. Um, in Mexican um, belief, a lot of people believe that when the butterflies come back, it's your ancestors coming to mm -hmm. visit you. And um, so Guadalupe and I have shared butterfly things back and forth. So it, it feels nice to be able to be thinking about how I can support butterflies. Yeah. I did want to go back before we do the final question, talking about um, th the fact that writers are afraid to ask their editors questions and, and even um, push back on an edit, um, which happens a lot of the time, like, especially if you have a good relationship with your editor, they'll be like, they'll, they'll suggest something and you, as a writer may feel like it's not the right change for you, but that doesn't mean that there's not a problem there. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, if you start thinking about it, you're like, well, what if, what if I fix that same problem this different way instead? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I saw a tweet today from someone It was like friends with a copy editor. And they said, um, you know, your copy editor expects you to just set some things, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. which, uh, I think a lot of people are just like, you know, especially the first time writers are, they're so scared. They don't want to step on any toes. They don't want to do anything wrong. Yeah. Um, and if you feel like something is wrong, like, um, you know, talk to your editor, talk to your agent about it. Um, it's and I, really think important. A, I think a lot of marginalized authors especially feel mm -hmm. this way because they feel like this is my one shot yeah. because oftentimes yeah. it is their one shot because of the way that publishing works and the way yeah. that punishes marginalized writers. And, I want writers to feel like their editor is their partner that they can go to and say, you know, can we talk about this? Um, because, so I actually just recently had a, uh, an experience with a writer who we got some feedback from some targeted readers that was a little bit more in-depth feedback than we expected. Mm. And, and how do we um, navigate that and the vision that she has for this book to also match, uh, not match, but to honor th the feedback of these um, uh, expert readers. Mm -hmm. And that requires a lot of back and forth with your editor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I want my character to do this, but the feedback is this, how do we put this character into that situation that is true to this character. You know, that's mm -hmm. a lot of, that's a lot of talking. That's a lot of back and forth. And even if schedules are, feel like very, very tight or oftentimes there's flexibility. If, if you as the author are like, maybe it'll take me a little bit more time to do this than I thought. Or thinking about things like when I put, um, Sometimes I'll be like, well, maybe if you phrase it this way, mm -hmm. I want, I want my, my writers to feel like I'm not giving an edict from on high. Mm -hmm. I am saying, could it be phrased this way? And then the author would be like, ah, that doesn't really feel right. But what if this, mm -hmm. um, 
most editors, our feedback is suggestion. Our feedback is pointing out a problem. And oftentimes it's easier for me to point out a problem by saying, what if? Yeah. And then that what if doesn't have to happen, but the author needs to get to the root of what the problem I'm pointing out. Mm -hmm. And if it's solved, then it's solved. <laughs> I don't care how it's solved. <laughs> yes. It's your book. <laughs> I, I, recently, I got some feedback on a book. Um, so the book that I'm writing is set in a town um, very much like the town where I went to high school. And there are um, less than 50 people in the high school, right? Um, 42 in my graduating class. I know what that's like. <laughs> no, I, in high school. Like in your high school, it's even smaller. <laughs> yeah. There were 12 people in my class. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the, one of the main characters is a cheerleader in it and it's, um, so the feedback was like, oh, this is kind of reductive. And, and yes, the point is that it is reductive. Like that's, that's part of it. Right. And they're like, well, couldn't they be on the dance team instead? And I'm like, there was no dance team. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were 15 girls in this entire school. Like, <laughs> you know, there, there's no dance team. Like they play Iron Man football. Um, <laughs> the cheerleading team squad is the dance team often. Yeah. Yeah, we, well, we actually had, we had, I was on the dance team. We did have separate, but mm -hmm. there was like eight girls on one and 10 girls yeah. on the other. We had, I mean, cause we, we had uh, cheerleaders and we had, we played basketball the same night as the boys team. So it was a girls team and the boys team. Um, and so oftentimes, I mean, not oftentimes, every time, like four of the six cheerleaders were basketball players. And if it was a, like a particularly rough game, like their coach would just let them cheer in their basketball uniforms because they're like exhausted. They don't want to do anything, you know? Um, but, but yeah, so it was like, no, I can't put them on a dance team. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I, that did make me realize like uh, what I wanted to do was, was have this character feel like they were supposed to be on the cheerleading team because that's the kind of thing that you do when you're this kind of girl in this kind of town. Yeah. Um, and I did, I was able to kind of like up that conversation a little bit more in the, in the internal thoughts and things. So, so even though that particular note, I was like, no, it did make me realize something else um, right. that I wanted to make sure. Yeah. And, and there are sometimes there are going to be things, especially when you're talking about a white editor, there are mo like 70, 80% of editors are white. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of which, if you want to know the, the exact details on that, Lee and Lowe um, did our diversity baseline study in 2015. And last year we released um, the update on those numbers. So go to our our blog dot Lee and Lowe dot com blog. Yeah, we talked about Lee. it when you were yeah. set on the show. Oh, okay. And then um, if you want to know those numbers, they're they're there. But like if you are a marginalized author, particularly I'm thinking of BIPOC uh, uh, authors, um, if you're we're talking about cultural stuff, and you are being edited by a white editor, there are gonna be a lot of things I have been working my entire um, career to try and inform myself, but there are things I'm not going to know. Mm -hmm. So a really great example of this, it's a very little one, but Joe Bruchak, um, um, I worked with him on four books, um, and a novella. And so we were working on the novella together. This is in the killer of enemies world. And the main character is Lakota in this futuristic science fiction world. And, she used a, the term snagging. And um, I thought, because Joe is a writer who makes typos. And so I was like, number one, is this a typo for snogging? Because that's mm -hmm. the, that's the, that's my reference in my head. Mm -hmm. And number two, why would a Lakota girl who has never had any kind of, you know, exposure to British media be using the term snogging. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that snagging actually means snogging. <laughs> it means making out. But in um, in Native American communities, it's kind of a, a pan cultural term that is used in a number of Native American communities. That's what 
that's how, what they refer to making out as snagging. <laughs> and had Joe not been able to trust me and say, hey, hold on, <laughs> that's actually just a term that yeah. we use, you know, and been able to say stet, you know, to that, we would have had a, a miscommunication over a word. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's not just a word. Sometimes it's a whole plot point. Sometimes it's a, like the what you were talking about. Can't she just be on the dance team? Sometimes it's not something as innocuous as can't she just be on the dance team? Sometimes it's something like <laughs> um, I was on a the this example came up when um, Joe and I and my colleague Cheryl Klein and her author Eric um, Eric. What's Eric's last name? Um, if I ever get out of here, um, <laughs> that's his book. If I ever get out of here. Anyway, um, she shared a, an example of um, while she was editing, if I ever get out of here of he has to want something. This character needs to want something. What if he wants to go to school? What if he wants to go away to boarding school? And if you know anything about native American history, you know that mm -hmm. asking about sending a Native American to boarding school is a pretty serious, he's not going to want to go to boarding school. Yeah. So sometimes navigating that means having a trusting relationship with your editor that you can have conversations about very tough things that even if your editor is aware of the history, just might have stumbled on something that really kind of hurts, you know? That's a that's a very hurtful like the boarding school history of Native Americans is a very hurtful history, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's being able to have a trusting relationship where you can say, "Hold on, eh, let's let's not go there." Mm -hmm. That was you know something we don't want to do. And Eric Gansworth, that's his name. <laughs> um, Eric and Cheryl had that trusting editor author relationship that they were able to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. and be like oh oh of course oh I'm so sorry I said that I didn't did not mean that at all in that way <laughs> you know that kind of thing that um it can be hard to navigate for writers of color it can be mm -hmm. hard to navigate sometimes for for marginalized authors and I hope that every writer has the ability to have those kinds of conversations with their editor if they have to mm -hmm. yeah all right. Well, we have one last question for you. Um, it's a question I ask every guest um, on the show, and it's worded very specifically. Um, what is the most important book you've ever read and why? With you defining important however you would like. That is super hard. If you've ever watched Ever After. Mm -hmm when she's in the library and says, I could no sooner choose a favorite star in the heavens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's super hard. But if I had to pick one, I would pick um, White Rage by Carol Anderson. Mm -hmm. It's a book that I've been recommending a lot in the last couple of years. Um, a lot of people are recommending books like White Fragility when we're talking about issues of equity, when we're talking about Black Lives Matter. Um, but the thing about a book like White Fragility is that it's written by a white author. And while I do think that sometimes it's easier for white people to understand and hear about these issues from other white people, I hope that we center people of color, particular black women. And uh, White Rage is written by a black woman a historian who goes into the history of the um, failure of reconstruction to do what we're trying to do now. Mm. All right, cool. All right. Well, Stacy, thank you so much for coming on the show. I was so, so happy when you said that you could come. So um you can Thank find you Stacey's... so much for having me. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. You can find Stacey's info, um, like website and social media in the description if you want to check her out. And Supriya and I just have a couple of more things we're going to do. So we'll say goodbye to Stacey for now. And um, you. thank you so much. All right. So that was a great conversation. Super yeah. happy.
um, to have Cece on the show. Um, so we have an audio book of the week from me this week. And it is, hold on, let me get it up on the screen. Concrete Rose by Angie Thomas, which is probably not a surprise, but narrated by Dion Graham. Um, so this is the quote from the publisher, International Phenomenon, Angie Thomas, revisits Garden Heights 17 years before the events of The Hate You Give and the searing and poignant exploration of Black boyhood and manhood. Um, have you read it, Supriam? I have not. I've been meaning to. Well, I mean, it only came out like what a couple weeks ago a month ago yeah. um but yeah so it's if you don't if you haven't heard of it it's um maverick who's the the father of the main character in the hate you give um when he was 17 and um oh i didn't realize that yeah and uh he um he gets a girl pregnant who is seven um um star's older brother um and so just him kind of like dealing with that. And um, I listened to it, obviously it was great. Uh, I usually only listen to audiobooks on my walk, but when I got home from my walk, um, was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday. I just like kept listening to it while I was like cooking and, and yes. just finished it. <laughs> well, um, all of this stuff is so amazing. So I cannot yeah. wait for this. It was really good. And also, um, Angie is going to be our keynote for the Orlando Book Festival, oh, wow. um, which I plan in April. Yeah. So I moved it up in my queue a little bit so that yeah. I can make sure to have it for that event. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, so super um, happy with that one. Definitely recommend it. Go check it out. Um, all right. Now it's time to talk about our viewer poll, uh, which is um, do you – uh, track the books that you read. Do you track your reading? So let me just share the results for that real quick. And I have to find it first. Sorry. I, I voted it already. yesterday. Did you? <laughs> I did. All right. Should be coming up now. There we go. All right. Um, so about 46.5% said yes, and they track with Goodreads. 7% um, said they use another app. 12.7% uh, said they do, but uh, using a private database, whether it's Excel sheet or, or whatever they have. And then 33.8% said, no, they don't track what they read. What, what do you use? I use do you Goodreads. Um, I, I mean, I use that Goodreads challenge as I, I, this is awful. I set a very low number and then I feel very proud of myself when I read way more than that. I'm like, yeah, 600%. <laughs> um, yeah. That's yeah. What I do. I was interested because I know there's kind of like, um, I hear a lot of chatter in the industry about like trying to get off Goodreads, um, especially now that they're owned by Amazon. Um, and I, I tried, I'm not going to say the name, but I tried one website yeah. and it just like, it didn't work for me. Like it was just the navigation wasn't natural. Yeah. Um, not that Goodreads navigation is natural, but we're used to it. Right. <laughs> um, uh, but there's another one that I haven't tried yet. I can't remember, but I think it's owned by a black woman. I haven't tried it yet. So maybe, maybe I'll try that next. Yeah. I would, I would love to switch off of that. I also don't like looking at Goodreads reviews. So it would oh, be yeah. great. <laughs> I mean, I mainly just use it. Um, well, I, so I do look at Goodreads reviews in in a very specific context. So I write for Book Riot. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever we write about a book, um, we have to write our own um, description for it. We can't copy and paste uh, another description, yeah. even if it's a publisher's. And so a lot of times you're putting books like on a list, especially a long list that maybe you haven't read, but you know, people that you trust have read. And, and so you want to put on the list. Um, I read the reviews so I can get kind of more, more, what, like angles on yeah. the topic you know, yeah. so they can write a better summary. That's pretty much the only time I read good reads of you. So right. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, sometimes I do read them. Uh, I'll read them for like some of my favorite books and I'll read the really bad ones. And then it makes me feel better about like any bad reviews that I get. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, well, this person didn't like this brilliant book. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. obviously good reads of you are sometimes yeah. <laughs> um, But yeah, so um, obviously most of the people who follow me are industry people, so this is yeah. skewed for an you know an industry group. But yeah, cool. 
All right, I'm gonna um, take that off my screen because it just makes it so much harder to navigate my screen with all that out there. Um, all right, so that is pretty much it. Um, thank you, Supriya, so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. This was so fun. Yeah, it was great talking to you. Um, if you want to hang out, um, it looks like Stacy's hanging out, so I can talk to you afterwards. Yeah. And I'll just close out with a couple of different things. I'll see you in a minute. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. If you're live, always appreciate you here and participating in the conversation. Um, oh, Jen said book likes. The best I've come up with so far is book likes, but I haven't kept it updated. Um, and Shilfari. Okay. So we'll try those. We'll take a look at those. I haven't tried those yet. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for those of you participating live. Also, if you're watching the replay, I um, appreciate you no matter how you watch. And if you're listening to the podcast version as well, I'm always happy to have you. Um, I recently discovered that I have a podcast listener in the Republic of Moldova, which I had to look up to see where it was. Um, and, and when I Googled it, one of the first results was is Moldova a real country? Like one of the suggested questions. And I was like, come on, Google. <laughs> well, I guess it's it's based on what people type out. But um, if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss another episode and tell your friends because that's how they find out about things like this. You can also subscribe via email with the link in the description. Um, and thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. It means so much to me that you support me. And whenever I, I have a question, um, y'all are there to, you know, kind of give me guidance on how you want the show to be. And I appreciate that so much. Uh, the social media for our guests is in the description. So don't forget to check them out. Upcoming, we have the Wednesday write-ins every week at 8 p.m. Still going on those. Still love those. Getting a lot of writing done there. Um, on Thursday at 8 p.m., I'm teaching another $10 class. Um, and this time it's on how to write a great query letter. So if you want to check that out, I'll put the link in the description. But if you are a Patreon supporter, make sure you go and get the link from, um, from the Patreon post because there's a discount code in there for Patreon supporters. Uh, and then, um, uh, yeah, Agent Chat Live next Saturday or Sunday, I think, with Andrea Sundberg on uh, March 21st. And then the next Pop Talk Live in two weeks will feature Pitch Wars 2020 mentees talking about their experiences. So hopefully you'll come back and check that out. I think that is everyone, everything. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. And um, stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, and we'll see you next time.